the night of February 6th, 1998, and the French prefect of Corsica, Claude Aranac, was walking with his wife to the theater in the seaside village of Ajaccio, Corsica. This time he'd left behind his bodyguard, and knowing this, a man rushed to the scene. Claude Aranac never did see that theater performance. He was shot in the head three times with a 9mm Beretta pistol by a member of the FLNC, a radical group called the National Liberation Front of Corsica, which terrorized the French government with violence on the island. It wasn't until 2014 that this group laid down its arms, and it was only because its hopes had been adopted by the parliament of the island. But why? Who are the Corsicans? And why do they see themselves differently than their current political reality? I'm going on a grand tour of northern Corsica to explore this beautiful Mediterranean island, see some of the Corsicans with my very own eyes, and learn some of its history along the way. Join me, and let's see what we find. On this grand tour of northern Corsica, we start in the northernmost city of Bastia, then drive to the mountain town of Cort, or Corte. Then we drive to the hometown of Napoleon Bonaparte, Ajaccio. Afterwards, we see the UNESCO Heritage Calanx of Piana, and finally stop in the fortified city of Calvi, before we flying out of Bastia again. My wife Mary was on her delayed bachelorette in Barcelona, so I went to Corsica. My adventure began in Bastia, where after three flights and 14 hours of flying from the west coast, my body was still wide awake at 4 a.m., so I went out to catch the sunrise as the city slept. Jet lag comes with its benefits, mainly being able to catch a nice sunrise in the morning. This harbor is all lit up right now, but a couple hours ago, I saw that red lighthouse here, Le Phare. I saw it glow, it looked like Sauron's eye. It was amazing. But yeah, now I'm hungry. I'm gonna go to the grocery store, get some food, get charged up, hit these streets. Whoa. It's amazing how in like these Mediterranean countries, even crumbling facades, buildings that anywhere else would look bad, somehow look good. <laughs> you know, they got like, they got history to them, it feels. Um, I don't know if it's like the sun on them or just the mood I'm in every time I'm here, but wow, this building is barely standing. And yet, I see laundry, nice chairs on the top floor there. Whoa. Pretty great view of the harbor. I wouldn't want to move either. This wall's got a lot of graffiti. Francais de merde, rentrez chez vous, like the fucking French, go home. Another acronym for the French to go home. And here it is spelled out, Afrancisata Fora. Huh. I've always uh, enjoyed France and the French, but I uh, also have never been governed by them, uh, perhaps against my will. So I don't know, I'm trying to reserve judgment. But it's, uh, it's interesting to see this. Wow. It's a really nice store. So a lot of this city was actually built by the Genovese. Uh, Corsica used to belong to the Republic of Genoa before Italy was even a thing. Um, and they fortified these cities and uh, and kept them as a, as a maritime base for all the different things that were going on in the Mediterranean, the wars, the trade. Um, so it was an important jewel for their empire. Of course, Corsica was conquered and settled by the Romans, the ancient Greeks, but the first real development came during the Genovese period uh, of which we have evidence today. It was really the start of Corsican identity, I suppose. Uh, Corsicans, most of them were ethnically from Tuscany and the uh, Corsican language today still sounds apparently like Tuscan. When the Genovese were here in Bastia, they ruled in an interesting way. 12 men were appointed and each man rotated and uh, governed the island for one month of the year. So. 12 people a year, one month each. Uh, it's pretty unique, I'd say. It's 
beach time. Bastia has these beautiful ramparts here in this old fortified city. See the beautiful blue water here on the side. Nice little walkway that leads over to that lighthouse that I was at before. I'm just gonna find one of these rocks, sit on, jump in the water. Going to that beach over there. It's the closest beach to the citadel here, south of the city. I mean, the water just looks fantastic. Can't wait to get in there. One of my favorite things is the smell of the ocean and fig trees. A little sweet and salty. That's a nice little beach here. Got a little lifeguard station. Sand or at least small pebbles. And beautifully blue water. Bunch of jellyfish at this beach. I actually got stung in the shoulder. This guy. This guy's not afraid of the jellyfish. Wow. <laughs> Unreal. I do like this red symbol, which is supposed to be like a, a little meme of Corsica. Bastia is right here. This is called Cap Corse. After walking around for the rest of the afternoon, I crashed hard from my jet lag, but got ready for a hike the next morning, 30 minutes outside of Bastia, where what I found at the peak of the mountain changed my experience in Corsica. Montestello. Here we are. <sighs> Made it to the top. This was definitely worth it. Down below you got this ridge in the ocean. Can't beat it, man. Best of both worlds. I'm going down back to Silgaggio, and I made a friend. <laughs> C'est mon <Hello>. nouveau ami. <laughs> Qu'est-ce que votre nom uh, encore? Baptiste. Baptiste. Baptiste is a pharmacist from Western France, and he's working in Corsica this summer, which uh, sounds like a real tough gig. <laughs> Beautiful views here. And he's also going down to Silgaggio, so we're going to go down together here. We got a little fog action again. Uh, he taught me a phrase in French for fog. It's called purée de pois, which is like uh, pea puree, um, like pea soup, very thick. Il y a un castrol là. C'est normal en course. <laughs> un castrol. Oh, je sais pas. <laughs> On dirait un puits. Où est votre sentier? À 6 minutes, ma voiture. Ah, parfait. Merci beaucoup. Vous allez nager où cet après-midi? Ah, je ne sais pas. Je ne sais pas. Avez-vous une bonne idée pour nager? Alors, moi cet après-midi, je vais à Saint-Florent. Ah, ok. Saint-Florent. Ouais, c'est. De Bastia, c'est à. 35-40 minutes uh -huh, uh -huh. et les plages c'est du sable blanc super magnifique d'accord c'est laquelle votre voiture c'est mon wow. ma voiture ouais well I'm taking Baptiste to his car taking a shower and then we're gonna go swimming somewhere <laughs> this is gonna be fun so after I met Baptiste on the mountain he invited me to go swimming on the other side of the island with some other French friends so uh, this is honestly amazing I'm really excited to uh, meet some people who are from the region here, uh, speak some more French and see another part of the island. So I'm gonna go do that, gonna go meet them now. Hey. Ça va? Ça va? Tu? Si tu veux. Quoi? Tu peux aller devant si tu veux. Oh. Ça aura plus de place. Je suis sûr? Oui, sûr. Oh, merci. here in San Florentin with my new French friends, um, Baptiste, Celeste, 
and uh, Florentin and came to this beach here, swam out. It's a bit shallow out to that rock, but still nice. It's a little cloudy, unfortunately, but still a great day. Day bocce game. Well, I was just invited for dinner and for uh, a lesson in French alcohols, so uh, pray for me. I had pastis for the first time, which is this uh, anise, like licorice flavored almost uh, liquor, and you have it with cold water. It was uh, very refreshing, let's just say that. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Honestly, a, a, really, a really amazing experience for me uh, to meet some people from the region here, uh, not Corsica specifically, but uh, from mainland France. I got to speak a lot of French, practice my French, uh, we had some laughs and we cheers to uh, American and French Brotherhood and uh, the 4th of July. Here is a statue of Napoleon. It looks like someone has put something over his eyes. That's actually a protest uh, in Corsican. So the Corsican flag is a Moore's head. Uh, it has a bandage or bandana uh, on the top of the head. But throughout Corsican history, when uh, Corsicans have been in protest uh, of perhaps their, their government or uh, an occupation or things like that, the bandage was put over the eyes of the Moor. Um, so that's uh, an interesting, subtle, but uh, firm declaration there on Napoleon's statue. This is Place Nicolas, giant square here. You have restaurants and bars and cafes with all their chairs and tables going the length of the square with a nice view of the square. Gotta love a nice French square. Here's a uh, store called Cap Course and it's uh, the sort of factory store for this liquor company here from Corsica called Mate. They have a famous uh, liquor called Cap Course. It's produced here in Bastia. So I think I'll pop in and check it out. Bonjour. Bonjour. Oui, je vais essayer un peu de maté. Oui, bien sûr. Quatre Merci. On stoppe la fermentation avec de l'alcool neutre et on ajoute des macérations de quinquina mm -hmm. qui apportent de l'amertume, de fruits et de plantes aromatiques. Voilà. Sur le blanc, vous avez des macérations de citron et de cédra. Quinquina, c'est le même euh, euh, par euh, tonic euh, Oui, ah, c'est ça, oui, dans le Schweppes. Euh... Voilà, le blanc et le rouge. Merci. C'est assez doux, légèrement euh, amer. Euh, quoi C'est légèrement amer aussi, bitter euh, Non, non, euh, j'arrive euh, par avion. Ah, non, oui, 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 non. non. Je disais que c'est un petit peu amer. Oh, amer. Uh, uh, bitter. Oh, uh, bitter, bitter. bitter. <rire> uh, J'ai uh, pensé, uh, uh, vous dites uh, mer. Par la mer, j'ai compris. Mer. Par... <rire> Désolé. Non, non, mais j'ai compris ce que vous vouliez dire. Donc, uh... D'accord, merci. De rien. Voilà. Très intéressant. Si vous voulez goûter autre chose, n'hésitez pas. D'accord. Vous merci. êtes le bienvenu. Je suis fini euh, pour, euh, pour maintenant, mais, je pense, mais <laughs> c'est bon. Ça va, très bien. Merci beaucoup. Here we have a monument to the many wars that Corsicans have fought in as part of the French nation. First World War, Second World War, Indochina War, also some conflicts in Mali and uh, Africa and French colonies. So I'm sure Corsicans have sacrificed a lot as well for the French. From what I understand, I think one of the major issues Corsicans have with French authority is that uh, there's not a lot of investment here by the French state. Corsica tends to lag behind mainland France in uh, 
employment and uh, socioeconomic index. So it's it's difficult, right, to to get by and and then see a country that maybe you don't really identify with 100% um, governing you. You almost feel like you have no agency in uh, in being governed, and it's not really going well. So I can understand uh, why like independence sentiment and nationalism uh, can take hold here because maybe there's not a lot else that, that you can hold on to. Being governed by a certain country though is not just some like ethereal concept or idea. Um, it really affects people's lives. A good example of this was a man named Carlo. In the 1700s he grew up in Ajaccio which is on the western coast of Corsica here and even though he was Corsican, his entire world was oriented towards Genoa, towards Italy. As a, as a young man, he was sent off to Pisa to study. He also took up administrative work for the government here in Corsica. So because of the Genovese government, his entire world was oriented towards Genoa, even though he lived over here on Corsica, far away. So a grand tour is not a grand tour without a buddy. So one of my oldest friends, Evan, is coming on this trip with me before we head out to, uh, to Corte. Evan and I have known each other since we were 11 years old. Uh, I haven't seen him in years, uh, so it's gonna be amazing. I can't wait, I'm picking him up here at the airport at Bastia. Check out this goofy bastard. <laughs> Check out this guy, what's hey. up? What is up, man? Hi, man, how are you? How you doing, bro? So good. <laughs> we went to bed at like, 2 a.m. It's 8.30, we're getting our swim in. I don't know how Evan's alive, honestly, given uh, I think he slept like two hours in the plane or something. <laughs> but yeah, Bastia gets down apparently. We got down. We got down. <laughs> Evan got the, the bar to follow him on Instagram. I don't even know how that's possible. <laughs> You asked nice enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't, didn't know that was an option. <laughs> you should talk if you're if you're jumping from there. Hey. <laughs> Evan's on another planet. The day begins. We go to Corte up to the mountains. We're gonna do some hiking, swim in some pools. Evan's gonna get more bars to follow him on Instagram. <laughs> Ready to roll. Evan, how'd you sleep? Tight six hours? Up to, uh, yeah, as maybe six hours. <laughs> more like three. <laughs> <laughs> Only about. We just got to Corte, found a nice parking spot right in the middle of town, right next to the uh, statue of Casanova here, the Duke of Padua. This town is in the mountains and you can see these like sharp peaks all around the town. It's a really cool setting for the town and again like a classic Southern European, Mediterranean, a little bit weathered but romantic area. We go to our Airbnb in Cort or Corti in Corsican. It's a little kitchen, we're putting together a little lunch. Petit cafe. Petit cafe. Look at this. This is the fountain of the four fountains. Evan picked this giant sausage for which we actually bought a separate knife because we didn't think we'd be able to get into the Airbnb fast enough. Now we got a knife. That lady was right. We could not have used that tiny knife. Yeah. It is 2.25. Evan and I are fed, relaxed. We're going hiking up in the mountains here in Corte. Uh, and afterwards, there are these little pools that you can swim in along the road. So yeah, it's gonna be a ideal day. Another ideal day, let's do it. And that's uh, Casanova, by the way, big ladies guy. We made it to uh, 
I don't even know what this place is called, honestly, but the, the mountains outside of Corte. I'll put a all trails link in the description so you know where this is. But we didn't get here smoothly. So if you come here, the parking lot at the end of the road only takes cash. And we found out after asking literally 10 times, we asked the attendant, we pleaded with the attendant, we even tried to sell her a knife. She wouldn't take it. So crushed, we turned around after somewhat dangerous and tiny road from Corte until we saw our angels. Not the Hells Angels, but a group of German bikers who we knew would buy this knife for six euro, the six euro we needed for parking. They came through in the clutch, and now we are here. Lavu di Melu, Lavu di Capetelu. Those are the two lakes that we're gonna go to. This is a little hut that has <laughs> Corsican cheese, charcuterie, and biscuits. Right in the middle of these epic mountains. Even in more modern times up to World War II, the mountains were one of the few places that provide safety on the island. What are you telling me? <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you the history of why Corsicans consider themselves mountain people more than sea people. Because they were invaded constantly, and yeah. so the coasts were very dangerous. Went into the mountains, sought refuge. You are right. Yeah. What's your name? Thomas. Thomas, I'm Trevor. You are? Nice to meet you. Trevor. 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 Yeah. From? From uh, California. California. Okay. And you? From Austria. Cool. Vienna. Vienna. Super. <laughs> <laughs> And back to our friend Carlo, who lived in Corsica, worked for the Genovese, went to school in Pisa. He was also an understudy to a man named Pauli, Pascale Pauli, who around the mid 1700s had ideas of Corsican independence. He thought the Genovese were taxing the Corsicans too much which is, uh, as an American, is a story that I am quite familiar with. And so, when Pauli decided that enough was enough, Pauli and Carlo took up arms, came to Corte, the town we were just in, and declared Corsican independence along lines that were then emulated and admired by people like Benjamin Franklin. And so when the Genovese tried to stop this independence movement and were later aided by the French, Carlo and Pauli came to these mountains where the Corsicans felt most at home. They battled on their terms and they fought for their independence. Carlo went up to these mountains with his wife and with his wife, they conceived their third child third child named Napoleon. Napoleon was conceived while fighting the French army in the Corsican Alps, but he'd soon come to redefine the entire French world and indeed the world itself. We're gonna go through that pass up there to a second lake. There we go. <laughs> And belle douche. <laughs> Why? Très froid. J'adore les chutes. Ouais, mais. Moi aussi. Et les lacs sont pas mauvais aussi. Un peu de neige. Si c'est possible, <laughs> je vous nager, mais c'est interdit, je pense. Hear that? Americans are respectful of the laws. <laughs> On camera. <laughs> well, thank God for German bikers. So happy we made it here. We're gonna head down. Evan is uh, debating whether or not to, to drink the water. What do you think, Ev? You're gonna, you're gonna roll the dice? <laughs> Some things are drinkable, some 
only drink them once. <laughs> Bring dysentery back. Ancient Corsican sayings. <laughs> yeah. That and uh, if you talk to my daughter, you're going to lose a finger. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the, uh, the myths surrounding the modern day Corsicans. So uh, from what I read, the murder rate uh, on Corsica is relatively high compared to uh, mainland France. And the reason is not just indiscriminate crime, it's actually a vendetta culture, which you can also see in places like Sicily. Uh, what we've also heard is that, you know, you gotta be careful. Uh, if you're a single man like Evan, whose sister you talk to, uh, whose daughter you talk to, um, because uh, we've heard that, uh, you know, you might lose some of your digits if you, uh, if you say the wrong things, act the wrong ways. So we also talked to another Frenchman yesterday at the bar and uh, the fears were confirmed for a good old Evan. Of course, I'm happily married. Meanwhile, somewhere in Barcelona, my wife is uh, on her delayed bachelorette trip, dancing her, her hips away, I hope, uh, and enjoying herself. And I'm the French wingman. <laughs> Evan on his way to his grave. <laughs> Drinking the water. Any last words? Chin chin. Chin chin. <laughs> Look at these, we got some donkeys here. They're beautiful. These mountains are amazing. There are ski resorts in Corsica, despite it being a island in the middle of the Mediterranean, not that far from Northern Africa, mountains here are high enough to support skiing in the winter. So they really have it all here, I'm, I'm jealous. No wonder the Corsicans are so proud of their, their homeland, it's so beautiful little post hike dip. We're going down to the emerald pools here. Find a swim spot. This is awesome. These are deep. <laughs> the hell of a dip. It wasn't warm, but it was tolerable. Apparently this Peugeot is like a Fancy, nice Peugeot. So we're living the 3008 lifestyle here in France. Scopa! <laughs> So here's the man himself, Pascale Paoli, who is the founding father of the Corsican independence movement. This is where the parliament of Corsica sat from 1755 to 1769. It was the seat of government and also Paoli's residence, the George Washington of Corsica, both the warrior general and statesman. Eventually, unfortunately, they lost that that movement because they were unable to capture some of the coastal cities from Genoa, places like uh, Calvi that were heavily fortified. So Pascal had to go into exile in Britain. Pauli remained in exile for a number of years until Corsica changed hands yet again. The Genovese were unable to keep control of Corsica and didn't have the resources to invest the proper amount of men to hold Corsica for Genoa, and it was sold to the French. French then became the legal owners of the island, but Pauli and other Corsican independents still saw it as separate from France. In 1794, after Pauli had returned from exile in the UK back to Corsica, 
he convinced the British monarchy to intervene with uh, Lord Hood and his troops came to Corsica, drove the French out, and the Anglo-Corsican Kingdom was established, which was basically Corsican autonomy under the British monarchy for a number of years. The British, being a major power at sea, were able to hold the island for a number of years, but eventually Spain weighed in to the conflict, helped the French to reconquer and reclaim the island that they had bought from the Genovese. And so the short-lived independence and autonomy and Anglo-Corsican kingdom came to an end. And so people had a choice to remain defiant or find a new life under the new French Republic, which had gone through the French Revolution, was no longer a monarchy. The Corsicans are unhappy with the amount of investment that's being made into Corsica by France. I think a lot of nationalism throughout history, right, has come from lack of economic opportunity. I think a lot of times we, we search for our identity, we search for our meaning in the world, um, and if a lot of the basics aren't provided or if you're living in a sort of dull malaise of opportunity, you start asking yourself why. A lot of times, seductive answer is um, because someone else isn't doing their job. And especially if that other person or that other entity uh, is not part of your clan, right? If you're Corsicans who have a distinct history from the French mainland, you know, have their own language, have their own people, have, uh, they live on their own island, literally, um, then those sort of questions are pretty easily answered by, look, who's governing us? Why, why are the French governing us? We're not necessarily French, and we're not really having a great time under this system. <laughs> Donkey one, dog zero. Hey, buddy. Look at this guy. <laughs> Eating crab apples. These buildings look like they're practically falling apart, but I'm sure inside every apartment is a nicely made home that you would have no idea what the exterior of the building looks like. Good morning to Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> How's the coffee, buddy? Amazing. All right, I'm coming up. Got to Ajaccio, parked here near the ferry terminal. We're gonna go to the Airbnb, get some food, hit the beach. I'm bringing you content from the restaurant bathroom because I found something kind of neat. I love this invention. This is a soap, just stays up, tilt it, so it comes out, tilt it back up, wash the old hands. Peak relaxation. It's 10 a.m. Ajaccio. <sighs> last night, uh, let's talk about last night a little bit. So, Ev and I <clears throat> ate dinner, played a little cards, and our night changed forever. We uh, met a man, may or may not go by Johnny D, a Jockeyo legend. He took us out to a uh, pretty much a Corsican's only bar. And I say that because some non Corsicans came in and that started an immediate brawl. <laughs> we were uh, taken in, they told us, uh, you're safe if you're with us. Uh, don't do anything stupid. If anyone talks to you and causes a problem, you tell them you're with us and uh, we'll talk to them. 
There was a metal detector at the entrance. Let's just say we had a good night with Johnny D and the boys. Thank you, Johnny D. Now we're walking around a Jackio. A little banged up, but uh, we're good. We're up and at him. Napoleon was born here on the 15th of August, 1767. So when Carlo arrived back in Ajaccio after the failed independence movement, after the Anglo-Corsican monarchy, he started working for the French government. He was regarded as Corsican aristocracy. It sort of shows maybe the path for coexistence between a larger power and a people that don't actually see themselves as French. They're invested in, they're given a chance for social mobility, and that then resulted in Carlo being part of the French Republic and his son eventually being maybe the most famous Frenchman of all time. Maybe that's a model that, uh, that the French should stick to today, invest more in Corsica, give Corsicans more of a reason to want to be part of France. Because uh, after what we saw in the bar yesterday, I don't think force is going to be the way. Yesterday when we were in the club, I struck up conversation with a Corsican in French. I asked them, you know, do you want Corsican independence? How do you feel about Corsican independence? And he said, yes, I want Corsican independence, but I don't think we're ready. Next up, Pianya. What's Pianya? Pianya is a beach town. Yes, I think a beach is an order after. After today and last night, I go. Another day, another beach day. We're in Calvi at, I forgot the name of this place. Plage Feel Good. <laughs> Plage Feel Good. Got a nice view of Calvi in the distance in the citadel. It's beach time. Look at this view. Calvi streets, beaches stretching around the bay. And we got a nice little citadel at the top. We're gonna explore that. Taking a gander through the citadel, trying to find a restaurant for dinner. I can tell you that the citadel in Calvi is beautiful. I can tell you that eventually we found a nice restaurant serving poke of all things with a great view of the sunset. I can tell you that we had some more laughs, but I also have to tell you that this was the last Corsican dinner we had together, and like all great journeys, it felt like it was ending much too soon. We were leaving the next day, but the Corsicans weren't, and neither were the French. I'm just some American kid, so it's not up to me, but I think the Corsicans and the French would be better off together. Corsica is for the Corsicans, this much is clear to me, but with a bit more autonomy and real investment from the French state, the Corsicans could have their cake and eat it too. 
and France could enjoy the privileges that come with administering this beautiful, strategic island. There needs to be more connection, more brotherhood, more pharmacists helping underserved areas and more laughs over pastis. Because if there aren't, someone's gonna lose a finger. <laughs>